Are you committed? Because without commitment, nothing happens. You have to be committed through the storm and the rain and the heartache and the pain and the disappointment or you're not going to make it. It's a commitment. It's not a feeling. While they was golfing, I was studying. While they was shooting hoops, I was studying. While they was playing games and sitting up and eating and joking in the restaurant, I was studying. You can't get out of something, something that you're not willing to put into it. You have to put your everything, your everything, your mind, your energy, your effort, your discipline, your tenacity. Nothing is going to jump out the fire if you don't throw something in there. It's not going to happen. But if we fight every day, one of them days is going to be my day. Hello. Good day, everybody. Welcome to Castle's Corner. I am not Coach Castle. No, I am Matt Morton, Natural Wheelchair Mr. Olympia. And today we're going to talk about consistency and the importance of the application of consistency when it comes to exercising. So, by the way, by definition, this is kind of my raw definition. It's the achievement of a level of performance that does not vary greatly over in, in a quality over time. You will build, but you won't be doing it exponentially like you think. It's not like adding a dollar to, to the piggy bank a week. At the end of the year, you're going to get $52. You're going to have it in small doses and stages. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and give it over to Coach Castle and see what he has to say about it. Hey, guys, and uh, thank you for that introduction, Matt. It's nice getting that to take it off my plate today. Uh, so, again, as you said, uh, we're going to be talking about consistency today, and uh, we're going to stick to just consistency with exercise. We're not going to go general with this, uh, but the beautiful thing about consistency with exercise is if you can learn how to be consistent with exercise, if you can learn how to progressively overload yourself with exercise, you can apply those same exact principles to everything from building a business to creating a website, a magazine, anything you're thinking of, it applies across the board. Uh, so for me, consistency, uh, I would say at least with a lot of my clients, it seems to be a very misunderstood thing. Uh, even with bodybuilders, it seems to be a bit misunderstood. I, know, I don't know how many bodybuilders take off season. Uh, if you're taking an off season, I don't particularly consider that to be productive or consistent uh, myself. But consistency for me is basically just doing very repetitive things on a daily basis, slowly improving, as we've talked about before, kind of looking at your feet as you walk up the mountain instead of looking at the mountain. You're just carefully placing your feet, being careful where you step so you don't break an ankle, you know what I mean? Kind of like that. So just in regards to this, I've been getting a ton of questions from you guys about progressive overload, training, frequency, sets, reps, etc. So I've addressed it in a lot of other videos, but I'll just do a very simple version here. Uh, the reason this applies to consistency is because you simply will not build muscle of any significant amount uh, without consistency. So consistency, let's use the term frequency uh, for a minute, replacing consistency with frequency. So the frequency for muscle building, the easiest one to remember and the one that just about everybody should be following unless they're enhanced, meaning you're taking, let's just say, copious amounts of drugs of some kind, is hitting a muscle group two times a week. Now, just to be very clear with my words here, when I say hitting a muscle group two times a week, I am referring to, of course, direct training. I'm referring to using biomechanical principles, training a muscle in an isolated fashion. And this is the best way to train, meaning if you train biceps, say, on Monday, you'll be then training biceps again on Thursday, et cetera. So you get the idea. Now, the reason this is the frequency, I'll just I'll spare you all those details, but long story short, when you go to the gym and you target a muscle and you take that muscle close to failure, which is basically what you want to do. And let me explain this because I actually just had this question this morning. Why and how do we know that training till failure is not as good as training to just before failure? And the reason for that is very simple. When you train to failure, it actually screws up your frequency. So I'll put it to you like this. When you train till failure, which is something, by the way, is a great tool to use. 
It's something I still use training to failure, but you have to be careful with how you use it. When you train till failure, your muscle will then take roughly eight to nine days to recover before you can target it again. That's a full eight or nine days. So you do biceps on Monday. You're not touching it again until next Tuesday. So the issue with that frequency is obviously you will not be getting nearly as much volume as you would be getting if you were not training to failure, you're getting half the volume. And how do we know that it doesn't produce the same amount of muscle growth? Again, a lot of complicated studies, but long story short, the actual muscle fibers that were grown, uh, particularly with type three uh, muscle fibers, and these are not the ones that have, um, uh, sorry, type one and type two muscle fibers. These are not the ones that have a large capacity for growth. These are more your strength uh, muscles. The ones that have a large capacity for growth are type three. And these are what you're attempting to do with hypertrophy training, even though I don't like that word very much, but this is what you're attempting to do with this style of training is you're attempting to get your muscles as big as possible. And this is best accomplished with the frequency of hitting a muscle group twice a week. And again, just to keep it very simple, if you are a beginner, this will mean that you'll be doing a warm-up set of somewhere between 30 to 40 reps, and then one working set or two working sets, stopping just before failure. To give you an idea of what that is, let's just take it back to the bicep curl. My body, my upper body is completely immobilized. My upper arm is completely immobilized. My shoulder is immobilized, meaning it's not going to be using any momentum, meaning the only muscle working will be my bicep. And I'll be doing bicep curls until... When I start to raise, oh, you can't see me. When I start to raise the weight, it kind of comes up slowly instead of the normal speed it would come up. I have probably three or four more reps until that muscle will fail, meaning I can no longer lift the weight. And this is about the time that you're going to stop and you're going to move on to your next exercise. So just a quick plan. Yeah, Matt, go ahead. Yeah, can I interject real quick? Absolutely. What I just said was, you know, differences in speed and that sort of thing. I because of all of my spinal cord injury and nerve damage and all that business i like rep tempo and when somebody says oh well i've got three or four more reps no you're going to be cheating mm -hmm. it should be perfect form reps yes, or yes. none at all drop yes. the weight if you have to and use perfect form you know let Otherwise, me you're working your tendons and your joints not the muscle let me dip into that just for two seconds, because this is something I, I actually have a shirt that says this. I had it made. It says uh, momentum is for morons. And the reason it says that is because um, I actually use this example in one of my books. Uh, if, I if I was to get a pair of 80 pound dumbbells and put them by my sides and do alternating uh, bicep curls, I could probably do like 20. I mean, they wouldn't actually be bicep curls, though. That's the thing. I would be using my back and my quads, I'd be driving, I'd be pulling, I'd be using my whole body to lift it up. Now let's take those same weights, I'm gonna sit down in a bench, I'm gonna put my back against the bench, I'm gonna keep it there by pushing myself against the bench with my legs, I'm gonna immobilize my elbows with an arm blaster, and I'm not gonna let my shoulders slip forward. At which point in time, you put a gun in my mouth, tell me you're gonna shoot me in the fucking brain, I'm not doing a single bicep curl. Now, if you drop that down to 50 pounds, now I can give you some bicep curls. But this is the thing that people do. They go to the gym and they start this. They think they're being productive. You're being productive when you are maximally damaging the muscle quickly, and then you stop and you spend the rest of the time recovering that muscle. So all these people you see, they're going to the gym. They have 17 different exercises for their bicep. How is it possible that they can do 17 different bicep exercises. It's because they're not going hard. They're not training intensely. They're not targeting the muscle with any direct damage. They're using momentum in their entire body. They're basically doing a cardio workout. Uh, it's not effective for muscle growth. Now, just a real quick plan to go over this frequency because I know you guys are probably gonna say, well, what's the plan? What's the plan? I'll tell you the plan. Here's the plan. Day one is arms, forearm extensors, forearm flexors. So that's this, and that's this. Then you're gonna do bicep curl. Then you're gonna do a tricep extension. Then you're gonna do a front delt press. Then you do a rear delt pull, a lateral raise, finally a shrug. Then you're gonna go back to the beginning. You're gonna do your forearms, et cetera, in that order again, however many sets you need to do. That is your entire arm day, stopping each set, one or two reps, just before failure. Next day, you're gonna do core. That's gonna be, 
decline chest, 30-30 lateral pull, scapular retraction, back crunch, ab crunch, oblique twist, and oblique crunch. That is your entire core. Again, start at the beginning, work your way through, back to the top, as many sets as needed, whatever level you're at. Day three, this is your legs. You're gonna do leg extension or sissy squat, whatever you prefer. Hamstring curl, calf raises. You're gonna do adductions, abductions, and psoas raises, where you raise up your knee basically. And finally, you're gonna do glute presses or step ups. Day four is off, okay? This is your workout. This is the workout of anyone who is serious about being a bodybuilder, serious about building muscle, and serious about their training. The only other things you have to do is get enough protein, make sure you're sleeping enough guys, and just wait. The best thing about biomechanics in this particular plan and everything else, it is the best. You can do it with full confidence that it's the best. The best exercises, the best frequency, the best of everything. The only thing now is human error, which is you need to eliminate your momentum. You need to eliminate all the Anything you can eliminate that would interfere with these exercises, you have to eliminate and just keep them as perfect and as best as you can. And guys, this is this is what you want to do. This is the, the exercise plan you're going to want to do. And the way that consistency factors into this is very simple. You have to do it every day. You get one day off a week. And so six days a week, you have to go to the gym. And I mean, if you're doing cardio, which as you all know, I recommend cardio, um, you got to do your cardio too. So let's talk about, actually, this is a whole other good subject to talk about with exercise. What are your thoughts on consistency with cardio and how much cardio do you recommend? And also for your particular brand of, let's say, clients, what kind of cardio do they do, Pat? Okay, this is real simple. You do so much of an old style of training that I used to do and you modified it and you improved upon it. So what I do with my clients I will have them start with 10 minutes of cardio and then I'll set them into the resistance training and then 10 minutes of cardio for cool down. When I was in special operations, they just said, okay, now we're going to go run 10 miles and then we're going to do all this, but they would stop us and be like, okay, now it's time for crunches. Now it's time for pull-ups. Now it's time for sit-ups. And we always had our towels around our neck so we could sit down and do assisted squats we called them towel pulls mm -hmm. you know it's we were just all of us probably about four or five percent body fat and just strong as all get up and not anybody was fat but we're talking about working out and it's consistency the biggest flaw and i put this in a two-part you know statement number one is sleep if you're not mm -hmm. recovering you're not growing and no junk food. You can have it once in a while. I'm not going to sit there and say, no, you can't go have an Oreo cookie or something like that. Or, But don't be making it a daily habit. You will not get lean just because you ate one apple. You're going to get lean by eating apples and fruits and vegetables and cleaner foods for you over time. And you're not going to get fat just because you ate one piece of cake at a birthday party. It's if you sit there and just eat junk food daily and then it's going to, but it'll slowly pile on, you know, well, and I, exercise I, is I should, absolutely no different. Just real quick. Well, I just want to add into this on the food thing, just to keep this real simple for all of you who say, I need my junk food. I need my junk food. I need my junk food, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You really don't. The thing is with junk food, especially if you eat it earlier in the day, what you're doing is you're introducing a new kind of bacteria to your stomach and you're affecting your gut microbiome. And on top of that, you're actually affecting your dopamine centers and two other centers in your brain, making you addicted to it for the rest of the day. So if you're gonna have junk food, I would really recommend you wait till the very end of the day if you're gonna do it, and then you just go to sleep because then you won't be craving the next day after the sleep. Second thing I would say about the junk food is the reason most of you are craving junk food is specifically because you're not sleeping enough. So here's what happens. When you don't sleep properly, meaning you don't sleep five to six ultradian sleep cycles, which is a 90 minute cycle of sleep, four cycles of REM sleep, you want roughly five a night. And you should go to bed at the same time, you should wake up at the same time. 
Now, if you don't do that and your sleep is interrupted, you have insomnia, you're not sleeping good, you're, you're staying up late, your sleep schedule is all screwed up, what's going to happen? Well, a lot of things are going to happen. I'm not sleeping is extremely detrimental. I just like to throw that out there. I'm guilty of it myself. It's very bad for you. If you don't sleep, it tanks your testosterone for three days. If you don't sleep, this is the important part of what I'm talking about now, it raises your grayling levels. Now, what that is, it's the hunger hormone, and it makes you hungry. Literally, it makes you crave shit. And what do you think it makes you crave? High calorie, fatty, sugary foods. So when you're not sleeping, yeah, so when you want, you're not sleeping, you want the junk food. If you correct your sleep and you then fill up your house with foods that you personally enjoy and are by your definition, your definition, not mine, your definition healthy, and you keep doing that every week, focusing on getting your sleep, and focusing on keeping healthy food in the house by your definition, then you'll do much better. And then just the next step I would say to that is actually setting a sleep schedule where you do count out five 90 minute sections. You pick a bedtime, you pick a morning time. Once that is established, then you switch over to your diet and you basically, you just focus on high volume foods that are low calorie and protein. Protein keeps you full, protein you need to build your muscles. All these things are very good about protein your brain's preferred source of fuel is carbs. Uh, regardless of what anybody on keto or talking about keto says, your brain always prefers carbs to anything else. So you do have to eat carbs. And the carbs are good for you, just eat good carbs. You wanna eat junk food? Just try to eat it just before bed and track it. So every time you eat a piece of junk food or something, just write it down somewhere, write it down your fridge, write it down your accountability mirror. At the end of the week, if you saw you had 20 pieces of junk food that week, Dude, that's like, who knows how many calories, 3000 calories. Are you think you're going to be making progress doing that? No, I have clients get on the treadmill for an hour. They burn 200 calories. They get off. They eat two Reese's peanut butter cups. They just negated the cardio. It, I mean, dude, it, takes, um, it takes an hour and a half walking at 70% on a treadmill, you know, of your max heart rate. So you got to stay consistently at 70 or higher. For an hour and a half just to burn a small mcdonald's french fries well depending I mean, on people and, and things but just just to clear this up as well there's no such thing as having a slow or fast metabolism the way the human metabolisms do not vary that much it's a bell oh, curve no. it's a bell curve and most people are i mean 90 fucking nine percent of people their metabolism is identical what happens is they eat foods which digest slowly or fast. That's the difference. Or they're extra sedentary or also their position they happen to be sitting in. These all affect uh, food digestion as well. By the way. And 95% of the time when I was having a hard time, because I journal everything, I'm very meticulous. And I'd be like, okay, so my body's not reacting this week like it, I thought it was going to. What did I do different? Oh, wait a minute. It, and most of the time it was my sleep had been off, you know, and I sat down and I was, I told my wife, look, I don't care what we're doing, but I got to be asleep, you know, laying in bed, laying on my side, you know, getting really comfortable by 10 o'clock, 1030 at the latest. And when I do that, my eyes just pop up automatically at 6 a.m. And I feel good and refreshed because I ended it with some greens and some magnesium and a multivitamin with fish oil. And I wake up feeling dynamite when I do that. Well, of course, you know, I mean, you I probably, you're, probably in, you're probably instinctively actually sleeping within your sleep schedules because you break up one of those 90 minute ultradian cycles. What's gonna happen is that you'll feel like shit. But if you sleep through them and you wake up naturally, you usually naturally wake up because you're at the end of one of your cycles. Sorry to interrupt. No, but that's entirely right. You know, you. And for those of you that might have some kind of a mental disorder or like me with PTSD and anxiety and things, um, sleep is one of the most important combatants. If your sleep isn't right, it's just not, you're, you're not on the, the conductor of the happy train. Mm -hmm. 
I have, I think, I think you've seen, I sent you this in my book, actually, I actually have an entire chapter just on how detrimental lack of sleep is and all of, sleep is the, the greatest legal performance enhancing drug that is accessible to everyone that no one takes advantage of. And I, I actually want to go on a rant here for just two seconds. So I am the most guilty person of not sleeping. I mean, I, I probably more than any of you. I mean, it's not a contest, uh, but I fixed it roughly the last two years. And I mean, I still have nights where, you know, I'm not the best, but just like with you, I have a very strict schedule and that includes my sleep. And I don't care what is happening when it is time for me to go to bed, I go to bed. And when it's time for me to wake up, I wake up and I maintain that. And when I do, my level of productivity is through the roof compared to when I don't sleep. And that everybody is the best definition of consistency right there that's true you have to do it you just have to you you don't give yourself the option that's the thing is i used to always give myself the option i'll stay awake for another four hours and finish writing this article i'll stay awake for another three hours and finish this client's you know whatever don't do it just don't and especially if you're i mean taking you outside of me for a second but especially if you're like watching tv and you're on your phone at the end of the night why are you doing that that is not beneficial get rid you're of that. your brain busy yeah you get rid of that replace it with sleep when you sleep your workouts are way better you get a better pump you're stronger you're more focused you're in a better mood the next day you're able to control your mood better the next day you're in a better mood the next day you're more productive you're more uh, you have a heightened sense of awareness you're more confident, you're less lethargic, your posture is better, you're more mindful. I, I mean, it's a list, it's a big, you know the big list I do? It's a big list, guys. Uh, sleep, you have to sleep. And again, just, just going back to consistency for a second, but I realized that we missed this earlier. What kind of cardio do you and your other uh, disabled clients do? So just for me- I will have them do a hand bike. Yep. Okay, so I'll have them hand bike, but if their hands, they can't grip all the way, you know, and they just don't want to put the glove on to wrap around. I do the little uh, foot roller stepper thing that's just like the little wheel and pedals of a mm -hmm. bicycle. They make them and they're great. So I've modified them to where I put like a little chalk block at the back mm -hmm. and then raise it up a little bit to give them some incline. And I have these people just burning rubber. You know, I've had people with cerebral palsy that have never stood up out of their chair and because of their consistent hard work they've been able to you know stand up assisted they've been able to accomplish some really great things because they never quit doing it you have to make this a part of who you are and make it central to your life because without fitness you you're just done you, you'll look in your 50s like you're 70 or 80 years old mm -hmm. and you're going to wonder why. And then you're going to see that one guy that you went to high school with or something that still looks dynamite, but you know, he still goes and walks, you know, he might go run a couple miles at the high school track a week, you know, whatever he's doing something and he's not eating a whole bunch of cakes and ice cream and this and that. Yes. He's eating them, but not all the time. Well, yeah. Like over the weekend, even as a diabetic, I had a piece of chocolate cake and I was like, okay, well, why do most people want junk food? It's lack of good diet and vitamin supplementation, but that's a whole different topic. But the thing is, I know I had that one piece of cake. So mentally I'm like, oh, I don't need any more. You know, mm -hmm. it's just... I know I have to take this amount of proteins. I know, know I have to take in this amount of greens. I need to know, you, you know, I, I just, I track everything. So now some people say, well, you're so obsessed. No, I'm just doing what professional video game players, they get paid millions of dollars a year. to go and play Street Fighter or Madden or FIFA, whatever. They're not talented. They're hard workers. You know, it's always a very, it's it's always a very strange thing. When, uh, sorry, I was gonna say it's always a strange thing when somebody says you're obsessed, like it's a bad thing. Why is that bad? 
you, you're mad at me because I have something consuming my life that I love so much that I'm actually willing to do and I care about myself. Why is it bad that I'm obsessed? I love obsessed people. You can always tell obsessed people because when you speak to them, the only thing they can talk about is what they're obsessed with. So it's a lot of fun. You learn a lot. You get up, you, you feel the passion. I mean, when I speak to people, it doesn't matter who I'm talking to, it's just a random person street. Hey, how are you doing? Dude, you have to fix your back. What is wrong with you? What are you talking about? Did you didn't, you know, it's my, I don't do it to be an asshole, but it's like somehow it, it'll just come into the conversation. I don't know. I can't help myself. Um, but I would like to, I would actually like to go just real quick because the way you just said it made me think of something. I'd like to give a shout out. Uh, I don't usually do this, but a shout out to my client, Sadie. Uh, she's a quadriplegic. I, I won't get into details, but might not sound impressive to you guys, but she was finally able to fully blow up a balloon. And she was actually also finally able to get most mobility back in her arms. And she has uh, spinal mobility again. So this has been, speaking of consistency, six months in the work of consistent, everyday hard work. And she's at a so much better place now than she was a few months ago. It's, it's not even funny. And this is consistency. And this consistency is her doing roughly 30 minutes of effort a day and tracking her efforts. That's it. That is the consistency to get better. And she is one of the most delightful human beings I know. I mean, really, she motivates me. And that's, that's saying something. And I bet you she'll never, ever quit doing what she's doing because she Absolutely. knows what it's like on the other side of the fence. That's the thing is you never want to go backwards uh, when you get to a place like this. It's actually, it's actually something real quick we should we should touch on. It's not a consistency matter, but it's, uh, I guess, a body dysmorphia one. I, I just recently saw this. Somebody sent it to me. Arnold had an interview. And he was talking about how much he fucking hated how he looked. He was disgusted. He wouldn't look in the mirror, et cetera, these kind of things. And I would just like to point out uh, exactly what you just said is once you get to that point, you don't want to get backwards. So um, you do have to realize this is something I'll have to come to terms with one day myself, but you will have to realize you're not going to be the, the prime specimen of your life forever. But that does not mean you should not always try to be the best version of yourself. And of course, you have to accept change change comes, change goes. I mean, you might get your arm cut off next week. You're going to have to get used to not using an arm. You might lose your job next week. You might, things happen, change happens. You keep moving forward. You deal with it all the time. It's a little bit harder when it's your body. It, I mean, how many people do you know still talking about their fucking glory days 20 years ago or whatever? It drives me insane. They, that's not productive. Reunion and the same guy making slushies for his uncle is the same guy that's talking about hey remember when i did this in football practice and i'm like dude i've been in 18 different countries and combat in six of them and i've been in a couple different books and i you know i'm a professional bodybuilder but let me remember your yeah name. i don't remember that but okay thank <laughs> you for reminding me <laughs> you know i mean you get it yeah yeah, I, I feel bad because they just they just freeze. And next so, look, guys, audience, <clears throat> please, never ever ever let yourself get stuck in a rut. Mm -hmm. I almost did that when I had been in combat and got my spinal cord injury and all that kind of good stuff. And I thought, man, I was on the Marine Corps powerlifting team. I was on their wrestling. You know, I'd won my pro card and ifbb i'd won the armed forces uh nationals in chesapeake bay virginia i was like oh now i can't hardly even stand up without all this robotic assistance and stuff and oh i'm done and you know now i've got all that and it's like dude you got to change yourself from lemons to lemonade keep that stand operational and I could sit down and think, oh, I don't look like I did when I was 18, 19, you know, like Arnold kind of thing. Well, I'm not supposed to. I'm 47. I'm bigger, thicker, stronger. You know, when, when you do a comparison for inflation and all that, I'm way stronger. I'm way healthier. You Smarter. know, I looked like, you know, I looked like a thoroughbred Mustang then, but I was supposed to. I was in the, in the Marine Corps. You know, but but let, let's um. I see we're running a little bit out of time here. I was going to say, um, let's wrap up, I guess, with some 
our favorite tips for consistency, I guess, uh, because I mean, just, just like you, of course, I've been at the bottom quite a few times. I've been in a rut. I don't, God knows how many times. Uh, so how do you get out of a rut and what are your favorite tips for consistency? We'll go as quick as we can here. Uh, my favorite tips for consistency are having an accountability mirror. So three post-its or one post-it on a mirror telling you what you're gonna do. Second tip would be a journal literally self-reflection every night. So before you go to bed, get a piece of paper, take a one minute timer, hit start and reflect on your day. How did you do? How do you approve of yourself? Do you disapprove of yourself, et cetera? Uh, another good tip for consistency is an alarm clock. Uh, now this alarm clock though, is specifically gonna be used your entire day. So it's a small digital alarm clock. And whenever you're having trouble doing something, say you have to read, it's on your list to do is to read. You're going to take that little digital clock. You're going to set five minutes on it, hit start, sit down with the book, and you're going to feel like quite a piece of shit if you don't read five minutes. And the only thing you have to do for five minutes is read that book. And you can do that with anything that's difficult for you to do. Pull out the timer, put it down. One minute of push-ups, go. One minute of reading, go. Cold shower, 30 seconds, go. So I guess those would be my three favorite tips. And as for getting out of a rut, my favorite piece of advice is get help. You have to get help if you're in a rut. Generally speaking, most people are not strong enough to get themselves out of a rut. It does not make you weaker. It makes you stronger if you ask for help and you're in that situation. Trust me, who do you ask for help? You ask anybody you possibly can who would listen. Okay, well, those are my bits of advice, Matt. You, you took a couple of mine uh, about the Sorry. mirror and the, and the journal, but that's okay. My biggest thing is you have to sit down and say it to yourself over and over and over. I'm going to accomplish this. And I, I don't care what it is. My bench press is better. My curls better. You know, my run times faster. I don't care what it is, but I want to accomplish an extra 10 pounds on bench press. Okay. Well, by skipping chest day, is that helping your goal? No. So the more you repeat it to yourself, the more it becomes who you are mm -hmm. Become your new and who you yourself, want so. to be. Always make yourself think about being the person you want to be. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to try and take the steps to get there in a positive manner. And that's pretty much it. Well, I think that's it for today then, guys. Uh, the last thing I would say is just make sure you check out the description. We've got all kinds of fun stuff. I got the flashcards finished, the books, Matt's books, all of our links, you know, all the stuff we do. Uh, check it out. And everybody, just make sure you stay in your grind and don't give up and stay consistent. Thank <laughs> you.